Once you start mining and running nodes, then you see the three part triangle of the ecosystem and how you can partake and be incentivized to do each one. You want to immerse yourself in this ecosystem because everything else is a shitcoin. I run S9s in my garage to heat it. It just heats the garage. Bitcoin mining has gone industrialized. I really think you're going to start to see over the next couple of years, it start to come back into like a residential sense, more like a personal use. Imagine every house having their own miners. You will come back and we'll do a podcast 10 years from now and you will see not only home mining but i think your refrigerators your dishwashers your dryers your washers will all have bit axe little miners in them so that when you're drying your clothes you're not just wasting energy it helps you get out of the rat race it helps you get off that wheel bitcoin is honest hard money then you start looking at well what's fiat and then you go down the rabbit hole of uh, corruption and inflation and the banking sector and you you start seeing things and you're like this is evil there's real evil in the world and there's people that will take from you and have no remorse about it you said in the beginning uh bitcoin are industrialized like uh, uh, what did you say industrious so we we find a way right like we're very like uh, we can look at two sticks and we can create whatever we want with it i i don't know like i see that in the community but i'm a millwright also so like for me that's just in my nature is to like find a way there's there's always an answer just need to find it i love that a lot really cool uh i want just to start off with the question today with um what's your biggest learning since you have been on my first podcast i think it has been january where we uh, published it and like december or something like that where we recorded it so like it's around like 10 months ago um what has been the, the, your biggest learnings within bitcoin or your biggest like uh, highlight within bitcoin in the past like 10 months Uh, well, you know, it would, I guess it would be the people that I've uh, been able to uh, explain Bitcoin to and that they've gotten it. There's been a few family members that I didn't think were going to get it. Uh, there's been people, it seems to me almost like I tweeted a couple days ago. For me, I, I try and immerse myself in every aspect of Bitcoin. You have your mining, you have your nodes, but you also have your tokens, right? You can hold Bitcoin. You can run a node and you can run a miner or you can do none of these or any part of it. It's a, to me, it's a three part ecosystem. So I've really tried to learn more about mining and uh, node running this year. Uh, instead of, instead of orange pilling people, uh, I find it's more convincing to explain to them why they need to run a node and, and to get them to build a node. And then they can really see like the, the nuts and bolts of Bitcoin. Once you run a node and you can punch commands into the prompt and you can audit the system, you're like, holy smokes, what's going on here? You know, holding tokens is nice. Uh, number go up, you know, your, your money will appreciate. But once you start uh, mining and running nodes, then you see the three part uh, triangle of the ecosystem and how you can partake and be incentivized to do each one. Right. Like I don't get paid to run a node. I, I do it out of the um, my own interest. Right. I have a copy of the blockchain stored in my home. It, I broadcast my own transactions. I had someone DM me yesterday and they, and it's um, a younger person. He's about 17. He's dating my niece and he wants to know the ins and outs of Bitcoin, not just where can I buy it? He's like, I'm trying to explain to people how the blockchain works and I keep getting caught up. People ask me a question and I don't have an answer. Can you, he's like, can you please lead me in a direction? And I sent him a few articles on proof of work, um, the Byzantine general problem that Satoshi solved for. And, but it's, I said, this is very technical stuff. It takes a long time to get this. Like, I, I don't know about you, Robin, but I've been studying Bitcoin since 2017 and I honestly feel like I, I barely even understand it. Like I know where I can buy it. I know how to set up and run a node. Uh, I can plug in my miner and point it at a pool. But those are really just surface layers of Bitcoin. Each of those things, you can go down rabbit holes for a very long time. Like even nodes, you can go down the deepest rabbit hole. We have um, oh, the datum 
is coming out for the Lightning Network. I don't know if you dabble in Lightning at all, but they're building um, Layer 2 stuff on Lightning too. And there's a new um, implementation coming out called Bolt 12 for the Lightning Network, where you can now force Bitcoin on people. You could load a QR code with Bitcoin. It's essentially like an invoice. So if someone owed you money, or you wanted to give money to someone, you could use this new Lightning implementation to gift Bitcoin. And we're going to start using it to try and uh, integrate it into bitdaycards.com and see if we can use uh, QR codes to gift Bitcoin to friends and family in the future. So um, learning about Lightning is something I've been uh, focusing on. It's, it's another rabbit hole. Like I said, Bolt 12, Datum is coming out. Uh, which I listened to Preston's podcast. He released it, Preston Pish, last week. He had Mechanic on there. Uh, I wish I had his name, but this guy is like, he's a wizard. And I've been following him on Twitter. He's the one that's releasing Datum for the ocean mining pool. And for the first time, miners will be able to build their own template. So literally with my miner in my garage and my node, I'll be able to build my own template. And when I solve a block, if I do, I can sign that template with whatever I want. Like Tommy Boy was here and it'll be etched in in history forever. So really, I there isn't one main area that I've focused on learning about. It's it's all of them because it's so broad, Bitcoin. <laughs> it's hard to really just focus on one because when you're studying one thing, a phrase or terminology comes up and you're like, well, what's this? You know, what's the Byzantine generals problem? Boom, there you go. Two weeks, you're going down that rabbit hole, right? And then you're learning about, you know, well, who is Satoshi? And then you're going down that rabbit hole. And what do you mean there's only 21 million Bitcoins ever going to exist? And then you go down that rabbit hole. There's so many holes in Bitcoin. You just need to really be careful where you're stepping. <laughs> it's, it's, it's super interesting because uh, I thought I have a good grasp on Bitcoin when I started the podcast. And now looking back 10 months, I understand that I didn't understand anything. No. <laughs> like I had no clue about anything. And still now there are so many things that I have no clue about. For example, I never heard of Datum. I have no clue what, what, what Datum is or what you were talking about, uh, what, what this means for, for the Lightning Network. Maybe uh, for, for the people also like me that never heard about it, what like in, 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 in layman's terms or like in, in general terms, what is that or what do, 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 does it try to, to achieve? Okay, so I'm myself, like I've just kind of started to go down this rabbit hole. Um, and so I'll try my best to explain. I learned about Datum through, like I said, Preston Pish's podcast, but I went and I researched a little bit. And so Datum comes out of the ocean mining pool. And if you know anything about ocean... Um, that's Luke Dasher's uh, pool for mining, right? So if you're a miner, you need to point your hash rate at a pool. Well, the more you learn about uh, pools, the more you see that it is actually really centralized. There's only about six or seven players that make your transaction templates. So when you see the block getting verified and you see all the transactions in it, somebody had to make that template. Somebody had to say, okay, I'm going to take this transaction that has the highest fees and I'm going to put it in this template because it's financially incentivizes me to put this in the block. Well, what Ocean's doing, they're trying to like decentralize um, mining pools so that we can take back some power, right? And so this is what I'm learning that if I point my hash rate at Ocean, I'm going to start doing that, but they also want to take it another step further because if you just point your miner at Ocean, they will build the template for you. And building the template is very important because if you centralize the template, you give governments an attack vector to attack Bitcoin. Like if they only have to go to six companies and say, hey, block these transactions, block this list of wallets, um, make sure that all your templates are OFAC compliant, then it's really easy for government to just attack six companies. But if we all are solo mining, which Ocean's trying to move towards, but in a in a in a non-solo way, it's hard to explain the technical nuts and bolts of it. But so that's what Ocean's trying to offer. But on top of Ocean, they're um, integrating a protocol that you can run 
uh, on the side and, it's, and mechanic says it's very light. It's like 300 kilobytes, but it's just a protocol that runs alongside your ocean mining account and it will allow you to build a template. So you can, I can build my own template, which really is, I think one of the issues that we need to look at as Bitcoiners right now is the centralization of mining pools. I right now, Unfortunately, like I'm pointed at ant pool right now, just because of convenience, right? Sometimes we become lazy as Bitcoiners or we just find the path of least resistance, which I find that maybe I've done this last year. So, you know, I've given myself a kick in the butt and I'm going to, I'm waiting for datum to come out. It hasn't been released yet. I DM'd mechanic and he said, uh, it's pretty much on the cusp of being released. So even if you have like a little S9 miner heating your garage, I really urge people to take a look at Ocean Pool and, and then to run also the Datum protocol. But you have to run a node too. So your node communicates with your miner. And then if you solve a block, it uses your template. So I hope that kind of gives you yeah. a, like a, a little bit of information, enough to get you started down that rabbit hole. I think it actually does, and I think it's a really important uh, topic also because I think th that's a topic that comes up more and more where people are concerned about that mining pool centralization. Mining itself is quite decentralized. Like I think America is probably the, the biggest one with like, I don't know, 20, 30% what I heard last time, yeah. uh, which is, I think, kind of great that we are decentralized in the and where the miners are located. But then there is the, the, the mining pools and there are basically a few, three, four, five that are really big and yeah. they, they control uh, the, the mining pools and they're not that many. Is that even if we would assume that uh, ocean is not working or like we cannot decentralize the mining pools from a like situation where we, we have those big mining pools going forward, would you, you do, would you think that's a major issue for Bitcoin or is it just a small inconvenience? Uh, for me, I'm, I'm not really a criminal and I, I'm not on any blacklist. So f for me, personally, it doesn't really affect me, but it is, a, it, like I said, it's an attack vector that the governments or the regulators can start working on, right? So as it doesn't affect me personally it's something we do need to uh start focusing on and, and i'm really grateful for the people over at ocean and that they've started this task because if they didn't bring it to the uh, forefront we wouldn't like personally i don't even know if i would know about it right and and the more i uh learn about bitcoin the more i actually want to run miners i want to run nodes i want two or three nodes you want to immerse yourself in this ecosystem because <laughs> Everything else is a shit coin. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really interesting. I, would you, I, for example, didn't run my own uh, miner till now. Like mining is something I still am not in. Um, is that something that everyone should look into in, in like running a solo mine or like buying one rig of an S9 or something like that and, and trying to, to get the tech working, especially if we can also get like uh something going like the the, the ocean mining datum uh that that's really cool um or is it only something for if you really want to be be nerdy and, and something about that this is great i love this topic personally mining is my favorite topic i think it has the brightest future um although um it's become really industrialized uh as of late like really it's big factories with these you know, rows and rows of uh, miners that run on 240 volts. Like, you know, here in Canada, uh, only our, our stoves and our dryers run on 240 volts or if you have a hot tub. So it's challenging for homeowners to mine unless you find yourself like an old S9 miner and whatnot, which, which I do. I run S9s in my garage to heat it, right? It just heats the garage because... Uh, the only byproduct of mining is heat. So to me, once people start waking up to this and seeing how uh, you can use this heat in so many different ways, there's uh, a few people on Twitter I follow. Mike Michael Schmidt is one. He was also on Preston's podcast. And I can share his um, Twitter with you. And this guy has a blueprint. It, he can has a step-by-step -step guide for people to build um in their furnace rooms 
They can uh, submerse a miner and heat their entire house. They can heat their hot water tank, their hot tubs, their pools in your home. So for me, people think like, oh, okay, well, Bitcoin mining has gone industrialized. I really think you're going to start to see over the next couple of years, it start to come back into like a residential sense, more like a personal use. Uh, you see right now that on Twitter, everybody has these bit axe, little miners, right? The, this, I think, is the beginning of the resurgence of home mining. I think in the future, the next decade, you'll see people like you and me, Bitcoiners, we're going to start like plugging these little miners in and and uh, and start seeing what we can do with them, right? Like, like I said, my garage is heated all winter by Bitcoin. I've posted uh, over the last week other things that I dry in front of the miners. It's it's an amazing thing, and it's just I really think it's just at the beginning. It went industrialized mining, but I think you'll start seeing the pullback towards more um, home mining and the use of the heat, like even uh, in Quebec here. I can buy uh, an S nineteen J for nine hundred ninety dollars, right and I can plug that in. It's 240 volt, 30 amp. It's a it's a big plug, but I can unplug my hot tub. I can have an electrician come here and just switch out and easily be able to plug in um, a 240 volt miner. So I think you'll start to see a lot more of that type of stuff. Even um, downtown in your metropolises, I don't know why skyscrapers haven't started to look at this as uh, we could all put mining facilities in the basement and use that heat to heat the water and the air for all of our residents or if it's a business skyscraper uh, you, for all the businesses in, this, in the uh, building. You're really going to start to see humans realize, holy smokes, there's more usage, use case for mining than just um, creating Bitcoin. <clears throat> yeah, it's, 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 it's super interesting also the, uh, capitalizing on the heat of the miner, uh, which then you could even go ahead and build a hot tub where the hot tub is heated by the miner so you just like plug in the hot yeah. tub you don't even have to uh, get a uh, switch around that you can build a hot tub with uh, mining with the with the hot with the, the bitcoin mine, the heating and, yeah. and there are really cool home projects uh, from people out there they just like go out there and make those those projects in reality um, really interesting will it be when commercial products are coming out, like an, an ready implemented hot tub that has a Bitcoin miner in yeah. them. I mean, we kind of see that already with like, I was a company called, I think, 21 Energy. It's an yeah. Austrian company who builds uh, mining heaters. You can just plug it in and it's super easy. And the miner is plugged into the, the, in the heater because I think we probably don't get to a, mass adoption of solo and decentralized mining if there's not um, a commercial product around it which makes it really easy uh, to plug and play that that, that whole thing um, probably probably most people will never um, figure mining out for themselves but maybe I'm wrong maybe maybe, maybe I'm wrong but probably the commercial products uh, has to come out to make that transition really nice which which will be amazing imagine every house having their own miners uh from i don't know so solar energy or whatever uh that that's that's a i think the mining industry is still quite underrated uh, in 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 the bitcoin ecosystem as at least as i think about it yeah like on you hit the nail right on the head robin I think personally, you can mark it down here. We'll make a prediction. Me and you will come back and we'll do a podcast 10 years from now. And you will see not only home mining, but I think your refrigerators, your dishwashers, your dryers, your washers will all have like bit axe little miners in them so that when you're drying your clothes, you're not just wasting energy. It's very inefficient. I, I believe people will find a way to implement miners into almost everything that we do that runs daily. To me, one thing I, I see on a daily basis is the wasted energy in vehicles, in cars, right? Like these cars are all generating electricity with alternators. I, I don't know why a company hasn't come along. I'm sure there's reasons, but installed miners in vehicles. So while you're driving around, you're also mining Bitcoin. And, and maybe it's a small fraction, like with how much energy you can produce, but it it sure beats nothing, 
right? Like my miner, the S9 in my garage, it costs me a little bit of money to heat or to run. But, uh, and especially with the halving event in April, it went from a dollar to 50 cents a day for per S9. But it's, it's 50 cents that I, if I had a regular heater, I wouldn't get. So you're really going to see people like me and you start figuring it out that there is a lot of energy out there that we need to start capturing and we're sending it through ASICs. Absolutely. Really cool. How was the halving event for you in, in April as you also run uh, a manor yourself? <laughs> Uh, it, like I said, my rewards got cut in half uh, immediately. Uh, I was actually, uh, where was I? I was at a Luke Combs concert in Buffalo, New York with my wife and two family friends. And the having event happened right during the concert. And I looked around and nobody cared. <laughs> I looked at my wife. I'm like, look, it, look, 840,000. Woohoo. We clapped a little bit. And I looked around and not a single person cared. Robin, <laughs> that just lets me know that's how early we really are. Like some people are like, oh, I got to get as much as I can today. Like that, um, my niece's boyfriend, he's been talking to me uh, via DM over Twitter. Uh, he's been asking so many questions about Bitcoin and he's just like, I want to know everything now. I got to get so much Bitcoin. And I'm like, I'm like, Jackson, just relax. You have your whole life. Okay. Just do what you can on a daily basis. Don't get overwhelmed. Uh, with it because one thing you learn when you understand bitcoin you understand low time preference everything on bitcoin slows down you don't need to rush life's not inflating away on you okay so you can take your time just do one or two podcasts a week you know pick up a book and read for an hour i assure you jackson you will be where you need to be okay one thing that bitcoin has uh, brought into my life is um, a higher power uh, I he brought Jesus and God into my life and, and that even slowed things down more, right? I understand that everything happens exactly how it's supposed to. So this is a beautiful thing. A feature of Bitcoin is why I urge people to understand it is it, it helps you get out of the rat race. It, ha it helps you get off that wheel. <clears throat> Absolutely. Really, really cool. Um, which I'm really curious, like I think a lot about what bitcoin will do to society and, and to the world uh once more people get it and once it's like right now we are a very small community if you see the whole thing like how many people actually understand bitcoin i don't count the people that have like um yeah they have like an, an coinbase account and they have like five percent of their portfolio in bitcoin uh yeah. th those people excluded like how many people actually understand what, what Bitcoin means and what Bitcoin represents. I, the number has to be so, so low. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fascinating probably in, in the greater things of it. But what happens yeah. once we get this number up to like uh, 10 million people, 100 million people, or maybe even like uh, a, a billion people that actually understand Bitcoin. And then I'm like, okay, let's let's look at the people right now that adopted a Bitcoin standard, what the change in, in, in their behavior, and maybe we can then understand what, what Bitcoin might do to, to the world. So the question for you, like, what, what did Bitcoin change uh, in you? You said higher power it, it gave you, or did low time preference? Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, I'm not sure if, if the higher power came into my life first. I, I assure you it did. I, I have to be very careful. Um, it, it brought God into my life and, and, and the Bible and Jesus. And that's really like I've focused just as much on that this year as understanding the life of Jesus as I have um, the life of Satoshi Nakamoto and, and Bitcoin. I've almost uh, found that Jesus is taking over my life more than Bitcoin, right? It's it's a real gift, the Bible. And I urge people, like I orange pill people. Um, and then once I orange pill them, I really tell them they need to look at, at the life of Jesus too and understand what that what he did and, and his story. Uh, and I'm not talking about organized religion. I'm talking about uh, spirituality. You know, uh, the fundamental the soul that you have inside you. I'm not talking about going to church and donating, which is, is a, a nice thing too. But, um, I don't want to speak ill of churches, but I find they're, um, managed by humans and humans are corrupt and, and you get egos involved in churches. But if you can just pick up the Bible and learn about Jesus, uh, it's going to add 
uh, so many more layers and, and um, to your life. It's a, it's an amazing thing. I really urge people to to do that after you learn about Bitcoin, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting how, how it goes, but but that higher power uh, did Bitcoin change something in, in in your behavior with the low time preference and and realizing that uh, Bitcoin actually like over time gives you more purchasing power than like less purchasing power. Did that change anything for you or was it like uh, just a different money and not really a behavior change? Uh, you know what? It was like um, a change in my integrity. It, it really, Bitcoin is honest, hard money, right? So when you start looking at that, then you start looking at, well, what's fiat? And, and and then you go down the rabbit hole of, of uh, corruption and inflation and the banking sector and you start seeing things and you're like, this is evil. There's real evil in the world and there's people that will take from you and have no remorse about it. So I guess I didn't want to, f to have a worldview that was negative and about evil. And that's, I guess, maybe Bitcoin came into my life and, and I could see that Bitcoin was about truth. It was about honesty. It was about integrity. And it was about, it was about more than just me. It was about all of us. It's about rules and not rulers, right? So I think in that, I was like, okay, well, this is good. This is a good thing. And then it kind of brought me to Jesus, which is good. His, his message is about love and kindness. You know, go and treat each other as you would treat your, your, your wife or your brother, right? Be honest, even if it's hard and, and help people help, help, help. Okay. That's what this world needs is more people willing to help. And I don't see that as much. I see a lot of people on the sides of the roads with flat tires and nobody helping them and like people not holding the doors for people and, and just even saying, good morning. How you doing? You know, I, when I pull up to my drive through window and I'm speaking to someone, I don't just spit out my order. I'm like, yeah, give me a bagel. And uh, I say, hey, how's it going? How you doing today? And, and I literally wait for them to answer because I, I'm interested in how everybody's doing. Not just, not just my family or like, I want to connect with people and I want to, and listen to people and actively listen because it's the, the best thing you can do is listen to people because then you can find out how Bitcoin would benefit them. Right. If I if I just force my thoughts on you, then you're just going to go, oh, that's his thoughts. Maybe not. But if I listen to you and then I can see, well, you know, this is where Bitcoin can help you. It, it really it's helped my game this year. I, I love that. Uh, really cool. It's also interesting when when I think about that, the, the Bitcoin community aspect, uh, it, it's amazing that we have. Uh, all those like podcasts, uh, the conferences, mm -hmm. the local meetups, the Orange Pill apps, like the 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 the, the connection of of actually real human beings that are Bitcoiners, yeah. and we have so many different ways to do that. Uh, and I think that that's quite important. What what do you think is uh, like? How how do you feel about the the Bitcoin community uh, uh, right now? How how important is the Bitcoin community aspect to the Bitcoin itself also? It's everything. Uh, I don't know. You're on YouTube. You're on a few other platforms. But uh, the best platform I find is uh, Twitter, also known as X. Uh, on Twitter, we have the best people in the world. <laughs> you know, if you want to know anything, you can go to Bitcoin Twitter and you ask and you'll get an honest to goodness um genuine answer from people and they want you to be healthy like you you, <laughs> you look at bitcoin twitter is not just about bitcoin you learn about you know cast iron frying pans and carnivore diet and and you learn about how they're trying to manipulate us and you learn about government corruption and you learn about fiat and gold it, it's the community is everything and i find the bitcoin community is one of the most genuine right i i my story does include shitcoining, uh, obviously, like I got into Bitcoin through Ethereum, NFTs, I got rug pulled on, Shiba Inu, I got rug pulled on. And all these tokens and NFTs were built on community. It's all about the community. But looking back, it was all about just, you know, a Ponzi scheme of ripping each other off. And it was like, it's really sad. And, and I was glad that it pushed me into Bitcoin where I can like see that Bitcoiners are genuinely good people. Like you, Robin, you're here on your own dime. 
you know, trying to bring truth and honesty to people, right? Like I seen you a year ago when you just started out and this was just about you wanting to immerse your life in Bitcoin and, and look what it has given you. This is, is a blessing. It really is like it, you can create a life from Bitcoin. There's, I have bitdaycards.com. It's a website that I could build a company on Bitcoin, right? Just a simple uh, teaching people about seed phrases. And then that's a way to gift Bitcoin to people. But you, you could also you know, set up home miners for people. You could build a business where you go in and, and set up a miner for someone in their garage. And, and you know, they, they pay you for that. This, it's amazing what Bitcoin can offer to people. You can't. I can't buy Facebook stock and then go and create a Facebook business and try and live off of my Facebook stocks. I can't do it with Nike, Apple, Netflix. I can't, I can give Netflix a million dollars of stocks, but I can't create a Netflix business where if I took a million dollars of Bitcoin and bought it and started learning about it, I'd see that there's like 20 different businesses that are need to be created just out of Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin backed insurance, Bitcoin backed mortgages, mining, even going and setting up nodes for people, you know, creating a consulting business where you can just, you know, set up a weekend class where you teach people about Bitcoin. It's just <laughs> the options are endless. It's great. I, I, I love that a lot. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how I think a lot of things have also to do because Bitcoin is still so early. Like we, we, we have like b b people uh, compare like Bitcoin to like a, a stock, uh, but then they're like, no, it's actually not a stock. Like it's an HTTP, uh, the HTTP, HTTP protocol, the TCIP mm -hmm. protocol, whatever uh, protocol you want to compare it to. Uh, and around that, then you can build actually on Bitcoin, the Facebooks, the, the, the Googles and, and, and so forth, which, which I think we're just like seeing the, the start of, of the Bitcoin ecosystem and the, the things uh, around that, because we will need um, uh, a lot of lightning networks, a lot of scaling solutions. Uh, payment service provider, whatever. Like we need, we need people and companies and institutions and whatever to build on top of Bitcoin the protocol uh, and build it out so we are ready for eight billion people yeah. <laughs> transacting and it's daily on it. Yep, it is definitely coming. I seen a clip uh, last week, and it was I'm not sure if you're familiar with David Letterman. He was a talk show host, a late night talk show host here, and I think the clip came from my. I think 1995-ish, so uh, the internet itself had only been around, I think, for roughly like 15 years. So we're at the same spot in the adoption curve uh, for Bitcoin. Both the internet was around for 15 years and Bitcoin today has been around for 15 years. So on this clip, uh, someone was explaining to Letterman how uh, emails will work in the future. And, and David Letterman goes, why would I need to write an email and sit here and hit and type and send it when I can just write with my hand and mail it to the person I want to send it to? And you could just see that it's no fault of his own, but he had no idea what was coming in the future. Honestly, I've it's 7.30 in the morning here and I've already sent three emails, checked it five times. You sent me a link for this podcast via email. We can't picture our lives without email today. It's just you know, billions of them are sent every day. So this is where we are on the adoption curve for Bitcoin. We, me and you are immersed in Bitcoin and we still don't even have a clue of where it's going to take us. We have no idea the, the amount of the wave, the tidal wave that's coming, right? And I hope it takes a long time so I can get cheap Bitcoin for longer, <laughs> but I do still want to see the progress move along. But just remember, the more the price goes up, the less corn you get. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's a double-edged sword. I want to see it go up, but I don't want to see it go up. I guess we benefit both ways. Uh, when it goes up, we know our purchasing power goes up. And when it goes down, we know we can buy more, uh, which will uh, benefit our purchasing power long-term. <laughs> so, yes. So either way, we are, we are, we are fine. Like it's, it's a weird thing. Like uh, once it falls, it's like, ah, yes, we can buy more Bitcoin. And But, <laughs> but I'm also happy when it goes up. Like it, it, I'm happy when the price goes down or up. I'm kind of like, I mean, it just stays stable. It's boring. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think l long term, um, 
I mean, we are not there at all yet. So like, because we are so small, but I think at some point Bitcoin will be boring and will mostly do nothing, but it, it will take a very long time till, till, till we get there. Until then, uh, it will be a lot of fun to talk about Bitcoin and, and, uh, and, and have, have those great Bitcoin conversations and, and see the, the Bitcoin price also. Like as, as weird as it sounds, the Bitcoin price um, for Bitcoin does not directly matter but it's really fun to look at it because it's kind of scoreboard on how well the fiat system is doing against Bitcoin. Uh, for me, at least, like for me, it's like, oh, yeah, Bitcoin will proceed. Uh, how how fast is the fiat system coming into the Bitcoin system? And that's the scoreboard for it. US dollar is usually the best one because it's the probably the last fiat uh, system to die. And I think it's uh, it, it's a great way uh, to, to to look at that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The uh, fiat system is crumbling. We know this, right? So it is interesting to watch the price go up. Um, I was in on family vacation in February, the last time Bitcoin legged up. And I looked at my wife and I said, just because we save in Bitcoin, it just bought us next year's vacation, right? This is what the purchasing power of Bitcoin does. Like you can lit like, even yesterday, I sold a little bit of Bitcoin to buy gas because I'm on a, a Bitcoin standard. So as soon as I get dollars, I convert it to Bitcoin. And if I need dollars, I'll convert back out of Bitcoin, right? Well, you look today, Bitcoin's up three and a half percent. Robin, that tank of gas was free. If I denominate in fiat dollars, I look at my portfolio today and it's up that tank of gas plus some. So you see, it's weird. You see that Bitcoin, like if you're good with it and you learn how to manage it, it pays, it can pay for your life. Right. And, and that's, I think what the fiat system should do, but we have a small group of psychopathic individuals that want to hoard all of that, uh, human innovation and development to themselves. And that would be the government, right? They have a button on the printer and when they print money, they rob us of all this um all this wealth that we create as humans like we're out there working hard i work every day of the week and, and i'm creating value and saving in bitcoin but i'm getting robbed by the government if i leave my money in fiat and that to me is like it's a really great talking point for people i find is uh lately is inflation has been a really good wedge to get people talking about alternatives and I, I found in this last six months, even though Bitcoin price has gone sideways since February, people are still becoming more and more intrigued. I'm getting more and more people that come up to me and are asking me, so, you know, what is this Bitcoin thing? And fortunately, I've done the research and I've learned what it is. So I have a good uh, time explaining it to people. It seems to go well. And uh, I'm finding people are warming up to it more and more. So... It's a good thing. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code ROBIN at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step and if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty and last but not least i have something completely new for you guys i partnered up with coin vigilante this is the most beautiful bitcoin timepiece that i ever saw created by anyone look at that beauty i love it so much coin vigilante made a 
and perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Yeah, it's the it's it's the carrot and the stick method, like the the <laughs> the, 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 the stick uh, in getting into the Bitcoin, Bitcoin uh, ecosystem is like the inflation and the pain you get from the fiat system, and the carrot is like oh like the the price is running up, and would I, I imagine next year could be the year where like there's a major stick and a major carrot <laughs> for people to come into yeah. Bitcoin, where inflation is is getting out of control, and uh, at the same time maybe the the Bitcoin price also. Uh, runs up it, it's it's an it's really interesting <laughs> to, to to watch both things and uh i i like it always when people come because of the carrot so they they're not in pain so like they they can still live their life they they're not in in danger of like getting eaten by the inflation but they feel it still uh because like if, if you come because of pure pain of the fiat system there's probably some financial problems in your life uh because the inflation is just eating up your your salary and and uh, <laughs> your salary doesn't grow with your uh grocery shopping list and with no. your rent and whatever you have to pay so i i, I it's usually more uh tragic if, if someone comes because of that I, I prefer it if someone comes actually because you oh, hey, know this bitcoin seems to be an interesting thing uh but yeah like both will be a massive driver uh to bitcoin especially i think like in the next like 12 to 18 months if uh, history is any, any teacher um what else happened the last uh 10 months uh we mentioned before the the halving but uh the bitcoin etfs also uh, happened, uh, I think, right around when after we we recorded, right around after we we published it. Um, how do you uh, consider them? How bigger is that, and 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 what do you think changed uh, because of them? Is that just like the fiat wealth that then opens up for Bitcoin, or how do you look at them? Well, um, I look at them as a as a good thing. Uh, they're going to bring more adoption in, right? As long as uh, you know, I know that we had a little bit of uh, unsurety there a couple of weeks ago with uh, BlackRock and do they actually hold the Bitcoin that they say they do. And Brian Armstrong came on Twitter and, and there was this whole thing where BlackRock said, OK, uh, we want to settle within 12 hours if we withdraw from our Bitcoin. So there was a little bit of uh, unsurety, but the way that BlackRock handled it uh, gave me confidence. They, you know, they didn't uh, beat around the bush. They said, uh, you know. Let's actually force Coinbase to give us our money in, in a shorter time frame, which is good, right? They should have to make make good. So that was good. That opened up uh, people's eyes. Uh, it'd be nice if BlackRock gave us the wallet address so we could monitor it ourselves. I know the other ETFs they give give you their wallet address so you can track and monitor, which is great. Um, and here in Canada, it's it's uh, actually it's against the bank's charters to invest in Bitcoin. So we have five major banks up here in Canada. Uh, that's it. Like we don't have many other banks or options. There's a few credit unions, but it's very difficult in Canada to become a bank. You don't get ones that pop up here and there. It's very difficult. They're very regulated. Uh, even Tony Robbins in his book Unshakable said in the 2008 financial crisis that, that Canadian banks were the best safe haven in the world for your money. So we have a very robust banking system, but they're not even allowed to buy Bitcoin. It's actually illegal for them. So now they can go and buy the ETFs. So they're getting exposure to Bitcoin, you know, by proxy through this. So that's a great thing, right? That's going to bring more and more adoption. And uh, I don't see it being a bad thing. Uh, the more adoption that comes in, the, the better, right? I believe in the future you'll see Bitcoin back mortgages. 
I listened to the uh, CEO of the Fold app. He was on a podcast there a week ago, and he's talking about how he listens to his customers and, and what his customers want. And the number one topic they wanted was Bitcoin backed mortgages, uh, Bitcoin backed car loans. So that like people like you and me, Rob, and that, that have all of our wealth saved in Bitcoin, it's not recognized by the fiat world. Like I can't go get a mortgage and say, Hey, I have a hundred thousand in Bitcoin. The bank will go, okay, so yeah, whatever. Uh, do you have any actual assets? <laughs> And I'll say, oh, no. And they'll be like, okay, well, I can't give you a mortgage. But now in the future with Bitcoin-backed mortgages, you can use your Bitcoin as leverage, right? And, and that's an amazing tool. It's an amazing tool for people like you and me that aren't Elon Musk and can use his, you know, a billion dollar position in a company as leverage to get a loan, right? Like he bought Twitter X on, on leverage, right? He had, he put up Tesla stock so he could buy a company. We can't do that. <laughs> they don't allow us. The financial institutions don't allow us that type of access. But in the future, they will. If you keep saving in Bitcoin, I promise you, Fold is working on this. They're working on getting out uh, backed loans, which is amazing, right? For the first time, you can use uh, a, a financial tool for leverage. It's awesome. <clears throat> do, do do you think that that fiat system will will always always be around or will we get rid of of of, of that thing i mean kind of like loans and stuff like that will still be around i guess in in a in a, in a, in a bitcoin standard world but uh, do we ever get rid of that us dollar of that fiat uh, world i i don't think in our lifetime i don't think you'll see it uh, maybe not even in our grandchildren's lifetime. I think the U.S. dollar is like it's got his hooks dug in and it's going to take a very long time to knock that off its pedestal. So I, I don't think it's really a, a topic that we should talk about. I think maybe you when your grandchild does a podcast, then maybe they'll be talking about that. But I think for now, it, we're pretty strong. Yeah. It's, it seems like that. It's, it's interesting because when I started the podcast, I was more on the side of uh, no, like the fiat system will collapse uh, quite quickly and, and Bitcoin will prevail. <laughs> but the more I learn about Bitcoin and the deeper and deeper I go, I'm like, oh shit, like that, that fiat system is quite strong. Like it, yeah. the network effect of the fiat system, uh, it's not something that goes away tomorrow. And no. even <laughs> like, even if we, uh, for a second think like, okay, what if the fiat system goes away, uh, like next year or something like that? that would not be cool like that no. would be massive catastrophic event uh which yeah. would be maybe good for bitcoiners but it would not be really good for bitcoiners as their family the loved ones and even themselves suffer because the world will look like uh, shit for a long time and we would need a long time to rebuild it. So I'm way more of a fan of a very, very smooth and slow uh, transition of like, there's this too. weird, uh, there's this cool uh, comparison of like, if you have a, sh a ship uh, that gets a leak, you want to let it sink as slowly <laughs> as possible. So. Yeah everyone has the time to go on the other ship that actually doesn't sink and go on the land or whatever so like if if we imagine fiat as like a ship we don't want to i don't want bitcoin to get to two million euros tomorrow because then no. the fiat system would completely be <laughs> I screwed so yeah, uh, that, that's just like <laughs> some of my thoughts are, are around that topic so I've, I, I'm a, I hope i don't see that uh, anytime soon yes yes uh, robin can i ask you a question I know you're Anytime, usually the one, I know you're usually the one asking questions, but you've had such a great year. Like I've got to watch you this whole year, and you've and you've like turned, uh, you know, a uh, two hundred view podcast into this juggernaut of a podcast, and it's really been a blessing to watch you grow and watch the things that Bitcoin has brought into your life. Uh, could you tell me the highlight of your year? Oh. <laughs> um yeah it's it's been a crazy ride uh especially like when when you were on my podcast i had like a hundred to a 200 viewers a weekly so uh that compared to now o only on youtube not comparing any other platforms i have like 70 to eighty thousand uh yes. monthly uh, uh audience which is uh, still like massive for me 
that this is like such a like I cannot even imagine such a huge amount of people on on one spot. Um, and some of the highlights, uh, there are two really big ones for me uh, because this one was a goal of mine when I started the podcast because he was the main person that Orange built me with with Michael Saylor. That he was on my podcast was just like this. Um, stamp of approval of, of Bitcoin podcasting. And then it was like weird that it was so early and that was like, he came on my podcast and he agreed to be on my podcast when I had like 3000 subscribers. Uh, so it was also really early. It was not like he did not wait until the podcast is huge. huge it yeah. makes more sense for him. Uh, so this also shows like he and uh, he has a, a major humbleness on, on that topic also. Jeff Proof was a major step for me. Yeah. He was kind of the the first bigger guest that, that that came on my podcast, like the first, like let's say, uh, re- really really big guest that, that came on my show, and he pushed my podcast from like 200 subscribers to like a thousand subscribers. Um, awesome. That was huge because I talked with him after the podcast, and he kind of encouraged me with the saying of like, "Okay, Robin, you are spending all your money in Bitcoin." but where is your time going? And then I was like, oh, my time is not going to Bitcoin. My time is going to IT security and on all the other topics. And I'm like, I'm not passionate about IT security. No. I'm young. I can take the risk. I can. I should go into where I really want to go. And this is where I then went ahead and actually like, I think a month or, or like one and a half months after I spoke with Jeff, I actually quit my job and went full on in Bitcoin podcasting, even though back then uh, it was not sure that I can even pay my bills <laughs> with the, with the income of the podcast because the podcast, yes. was, the podcast was still uh, quite quite small. Yeah, but there was one more highlight I want to mention. Uh, I was on the main stage at Bitcoin Amsterdam uh, just last week, uh, and this was an unbelievable highlight uh, for me because this is like wow. Uh, they actually let me on the main stage in front of like two or three thousand people. Uh, wow. We're online also watching so many tens of thousands of people. And this is like the a year ago, I was watching like uh, the 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 big Bitcoin conferences and all the big, uh, big speakers there, like a Super Bowl, like a <laughs> like a major event for me. And all of a sudden, a year later, I'm I'm myself on that stage. So yeah, it has been That's a quite amazing. a lot uh, for me. That's kind of <laughs> my 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 year, my personal year. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin and has all to do with Bitcoin because Bitcoin enabled this, the Bitcoin community enabled this. Uh, but this is just like uh, my my personal uh, year uh, for for that. That's amazing, isn't that a gift from Bitcoin? Like you've been able to do this just off of you know hard money. This is like proof of work. Right. You are proof of work. And, and that is the backbone of Bitcoin. And I love explaining to people proof of work because they don't understand like, uh, the mining aspect of Bitcoin and how, what, what, what's proof of work. Right. And I say to them, I'm like, your proof of work. I'm like, everything around you is proof of work. Right. We live in this fiat society that, that wants proof of stake. If you have money, you should get more money. That's a fiat mindset cancer. And I, and it really, I, it bothers me like these investors like Warren Buffett that gets like $3 billion a year and just dividends just because he was an early investor and his big pile of money is bigger. For some reason, he should just get more naturally. And it's hard for people to break that mindset and that concept and uh, because they want that people want the easy money but we learn in bitcoin that if it's easy it's probably a scam right so you need to work hard in life everything has to be proof of work i tell my kids that like i love watching my kids work hard like lifting wood and carrying it and sweating and getting dirty that's life okay the other is cancer that's fiat so it's great to see you putting in the work and the proof and building this. this is amazing. When you asked me to come back on, I was like, absolutely. I'd love to have a conversation just to see how your year has been. Uh, I see you had Dylan LeClaire on, uh, on Friday. He just showed up at your house. <laughs> it was like a knock at the door. And here's like one of the biggest guys in Twitter. Also uh, biggest guys in Bitcoin coming to talk to you. Like this is uh, like, when I see these things, I show my son and he's like, Dylan LeClaire, dad, why does Robin want to talk to you? <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I, I'm not too sure. <laughs> you talk to Michael Saylor, you talk to Jeff Booth, Dylan LeClerc, like you, I would love to see you talk to Preston Pish next. He was the one that orange pill me. Uh, and, and he's like one of the most uh, loyal and honest Bitcoiners I find. And he has the, the greatest integrity. Uh, so if, if anything, I would love to see you get Preston Pish. I'm going to, when, when we yeah, post I, this, I, I'm going to tag him and make sure that you get him. Yeah, I, I definitely want him also. Uh, I, I want him, like my show is pl split, I think, in three parts of guests. Um, the, the one part is just like uh, a small part of the podcast, actually, like the highlight people of like Michael Saylor, uh, Dylan LeClaire, uh, Jack Mala, down the road, Preston Beach, like the really like the, the people that everyone knows in, in Bitcoin. Um, this is like a, the, probably the smallest part of the podcast because I do seven a, a, a mm -hmm. week. You cannot feel like uh, so, so many in there. Uh, a big part that I'm really proud uh, of, of doing is getting people that have never, ever been on a podcast on my podcast. And it's around probably like 10 to 20% of my whole podcast is people that have never, ever been on any podcast, not Bitcoin podcast, but no, no podcast at all. Yeah. And they, they just DM me or I DM them. However, we get in contact and they're like, Hey, I have this story. I really want like to, to share it in the podcast. And I'm like, yeah, let's try. Like if it works out, we will publish it. If not, uh, th then we don't. Uh, and there has been some, some people, uh, that I have discovered with that, that were like, just like amazing. There was like a science teacher. He DM me and he was like, Hey, I have this story. Mm -hmm. I would like to share. And I was like, yeah, let's try it. And one of the most successful episodes till now, like in, in the wow. top 20 episodes or something like that. And he had not even a social media account. Like <laughs> he was completely <laughs> uh, uh, scrapped from, from social media. And that's kind of what I'm really also proud of giving a stage to uh, just plebs that are in the real world, not even working in Bitcoin, just like being a science teacher or being like an engineer or, or some, some small entrepreneur. And they just want to share their Bitcoin perspective because I think they are like, we all heard Michael Saylor and Preston Pish and, and Jack Malas. They're great. We all heard them so many times. I still want to have them on mm -hmm. uh, because it's fascinating to talk to them and you can always learn more. Yeah. Uh, but for me, I'm so excited about just getting someone on that have never been on because you cannot even research them. You just go yeah. completely blank in a conversation. And that's, that's an amazing uh, feeling. And the third category uh, is where I try to have people on that have a connection to Bitcoin, but are not full into Bitcoin. For example, there's a German company that now does the MicroStrategy playbook okay. in Germany with offering 30 million euros uh, and bonds and buying with that Bitcoin. Wow. Uh, and I just uh, saw that and DM'd him, like, hey, do you want to jump on the, uh, uh, on the podcast? He's just the CEO of a, a company, uh, not a, a Bitcoiner per se, but he gets Bitcoin and he wants to adopt a Bitcoin strategy in his company. And I was like, hey, he is cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's, that's like the, you know, the third, like he's not a real Bitcoiner, like he's not entrenched in the Bitcoin community and speaking yeah. at all the events, but he, he gets Bitcoin and he wants to adopt Bitcoin in his life and he has achieved something great in another uh, life. So th that's kind of the third part of, of, of my guest. Sorry for, for no, that's, speaking I wanted so much to about the talk. podcast. But I, no, I, you know what the thing is? Like, have you been on any other podcasts, Robin? Yeah, actually, I've been, I have a list. Like, that's maybe also interesting for some of my subscribers uh, because I don't repost the podcast I've been on uh, directly on the channel, but I have um, a guest appearance youtube yeah. playlist featured on my youtube homepage. like if you go to my profile and go directly on home uh, there's one playlist where i collect all my guest appearances it's like That's 18 cool. or 19 now of them uh, wow. sometimes it's like a show where more guests are on sometimes it's just me sometimes it's just a recording of a twitter space uh it's it's been really cool uh, to also tell my story, yeah. Um, but I didn't share it directly on the channel. Uh, but I have been collecting the YouTube playlist, and everyone that is interested in that can just check that out. And oh, I'm gonna and find, find it. The, I'm gonna find the, it, the, the, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna watch <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, 
I like I like learning. Yeah, like the, I'm the same as you. I like I want to learn about these people because you will stumble across uh, like a science teacher that will just blow your mind. That will change you. Right? It's not like like you said the Michael Sailors, the big people. They have great messages, and and I love listening to them. But it's really the small seedlings that have these just nuggets of information that you can really build on. Like I said, I learned about mechanic last week on on Preston's podcast, and it's just been like this guy has a way of thinking that I just is amazing, and the and the responses he has and the way he communicates is just it's epic, right? And and I want more of these people in my life right that have truth and integrity and they're trying to do the right things in life even when nobody's looking right because that is the definition of integrity is can you do the right thing when nobody's watching and and those are the type of people i need in my life because i want to emulate that and and that is a gift of bitcoin it's amazing i like to watch you and this whole year and do your thing it's it's been crazy and i'm glad that you told me that there's like a i can learn more about you because you're always the one asking questions you know <laughs> you're the interviewer i want to see you be the interviewee maybe get a little uncomfortable ask the hard questions <laughs> i i'm actually uh it's, it's interesting because i actually i'm way more comfortable hosting than being the guest um, but I get more comfortable now with being the guest because I have done it now like uh, around 20 times. Uh, wow. So that it's been better and better. Also in, in Bitcoin Amsterdam, I've been interviewed, I think, by three people uh, with camera, just like a quick like five to 10 minutes uh, interview uh, on, on like the, the, the area there because then, hey, I saw your channel, let's do a quick interview. I'm really interested also in, in getting those out and seeing them uh, being released. Uh, because this was just literally like I uh, just like walk from one stage to another stage, uh, and in between uh, me watching mm-hmm. a show or me watching the, the stage in Amsterdam, a uh, guy came up like, "Hey, do you have time for five minutes uh, 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 and two questions?" And I'm like, "Yeah, okay." And then just like camera, Boom. there you go, like <laughs> zero, yeah, yeah. zero preparation, nothing you know before, <laughs> and it's just like going go, going with the flow. And yes, it's completely uncomfortable, mm-hmm. um, but. I always seek the the uncomfort because yes. I think in the uncomfort, this is where you grow. And for me, starting the podcast was really uncomfortable. Like I, I, I wasn't born, like I, I was not like, oh, let's go on camera. I want to be seen. I want to be, like, that was not me 100%. That's why I ask questions. That's why I put someone else in the, in, in the highlight because that's more me. I'm more of a listener less of a of a speaker but i i speak more and more because i i'm, I'm draining that a lot <laughs> yeah yeah and you're doing and, and, much and better you know it's amazing like uh to watch your first few episodes and see you now you're you're very you're very comfortable it comes naturally to you. you're doing so well it's amazing to see and it uh, like i'd like to ask you like is it something that takes practice or is it something that you're still just as uncomfortable but you just do it anyways or do you find that your nerves have come down over time oh yeah my nerves have come down completely like <laughs> um now it's uh, uh my first few episodes were like f- uh, i prepared like two hours one and a half hour <laughs> three hours and really tried to research and like oh what question can i ask now <laughs> i research maybe 20 to 30 minutes and sometimes even like just 10 minutes and i even did some podcast episodes uh where i did not re- research at all um, because either there was nothing to research as with the people that haven't been online, um, or because I just overlooked the time. I was like, oh shit, like now I have the podcast, now I have to go online. Um, this happened also in so many episodes. And hmm. I saw that I'm really good in uh, just improvising questions and just going with the flow because I have done it so many times. I couldn't have done it in the first episodes. But now as I've done 280 episodes, now I can actually wow. do that. So you get really good. Um, and also interesting, I don't know if you have that, but in your mind, if you have in your mind something going on, like you imagine yourself on a, on a stage or something like that, I always imagine myself speaking really good. Uh, then you go on stage and you're like, oh shit, I, I don't speak <laughs> as good as I'm speaking in my <laughs> dreams. Yeah. <laughs> and, and And I found myself... Uh, closing that gap between uh, how I imagine being speaking on on, on a podcast and, and speaking on a stage uh, versus how I actually do 
because I think the the true that your true self, your uh, integrity, uh, your honesty comes out more. Like you need to be comfortable to be honest with yourself, to be an in, integral person. Because if you're like stressed, you're not really yourself, mm -hmm. uh, and that come that goes completely over time. Uh, and yeah, now I can just like have. A, like a major person like Dylan Leclerc in my apartment and I'm not stressing out. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, so, so I'm still nervous, but I'm not st stressing out. So like, that's definitely something with, 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 with practice that goes away. Uh, yeah, really, really cool. Yeah. yeah. It's been a real pleasure, Robin, watching you this year. Like, uh, I love putting on your podcast and just listening to your guys' conversations, whoever you may be interviewing. And I thank you for allowing me to be on. Like, like I say, you've interviewed the biggest and now you've interviewed the worst. <laughs> <laughs> you're at the top now you're down at the bottom all right <laughs> scraping the bottom of the barrel <laughs> tommy boy ah that's good no uh i actually like it's an interesting question of like who can i in, in uh invite like for a second podcast and for a podcast uh, I just enjoyed our conversation so much. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's invite him back on. And I also look at some metrics of like, how long did the viewers watch? Did they like all opt out at like five minutes or like, did they watch like on average 12 or 13 or 15 minutes, which is a good average for duration. Uh, and I just saw like, first of all, I enjoyed it a lot with you, but I saw that, uh, your podcast was one of the first that. Uh, people really watched for a long time. Wow. Uh, so that gave me also an indicator that people actually like to listen to you uh, because the average view duration was is up significantly to, to some of the other early ones. Awesome. Uh, and most of that has, has also to do like my interview style is going better. So people now watch in general a little bit longer. Uh, but you were like the early ones that was has a really good average view duration that has, has all to do with you. Uh, so that's a, like, I, I really wanted to to have you back on uh, because I loved our conversation and the audience uh, liked it too, obviously. So that was a great, great match. <laughs> that's cool. I think, I think when you're passionate about something, it just comes out of you and then that attracts people. And I find <clears throat> with me or you, or me and you, we're very passionate about Bitcoin. Like I'm not just buying you know my dca weekly and just you know going and doing the rest of my fiat life like i literally when i'm not taking care of my kids and being with my family i'm digesting as much information as i can about bitcoin because i realize what it actually is it's you know it's decentralized it's immutable it's permissionless money and the 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 things that it offers people far away any other financial instrument in this world like it gives you the ability to say if you were um say you're in palestine or or um israel right now or whatnot and you're in a war-torn country and you're a wealthy person like bitcoin for the first time you can travel over borders with a 12-word seed phrase in your head like that's amazing to me is like you could be uh, have a million dollars in Bitcoin and the regime changes in your town or your village and you have to flee. And, and all you need is 12 words and you can go and, and, and recoup your wealth. And that's what I urge people to do. Uh, if anything is you should try and recover uh, a wallet from the seed phrase. It, it's a really powerful thing. I did it with a person I'm trying to teach about Bitcoin uh, recently. Like I said, my niece's boyfriend. Well, I donated, or I gave my niece Bitcoin for Christmas and it sat there. Uh, and I actually, I gave her $60 in Bitcoin, December, 2023. It's actually worth $85 right now. So I urge anybody to look at what you got your family for Christmas and you see if it's still as valuable as when you bought it or if it's less, right? That's what I like about Bitcoin is I gift it to you and it increases in value over time. So it's an amazing thing. Her Bitcoin had appreciated in value. Well, her boyfriend was getting into Bitcoin. I said, Jackson, why don't you try and recover Hannah's Bitcoin via her seed phrase? And he didn't know how to do it. And so I took him through the steps of going into Blue Wallet, importing a wallet, typing the seed phrase in, and then boom, the Bitcoin's on his phone. It's not on his phone, but he has access to the Bitcoin. He's like, wow. I, I could see his first text back to me was, wow. And like that is an eye-opening moment for people when they can use the seed phrase 
to recover funds. So that in closing, if, if anything, I'd urge people to run a node, recover your seed phrase uh, once and, and find an old miner, an S9 miner on marketplace. And although you're not going to make money at it, you're going to learn what it's like to contribute hash rate to the network. It's, it's a really empowering thing. I, I love that a lot. Really, really cool. Uh, and I think that's a, a great way to also to end the podcast. I have two more questions. The one question is now, uh, I did that after, um, I think around episode 50 or something like that. I introduced that uh, new method of ending the podcast where I asked one question is always the same question. Uh, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Uh, actually, um, I did, I had posted in the past, I am like a mechanic, so I'm a millwright, so I do fix things. I have posted uh, on my Twitter about taking apart my dryer. Uh, you know, the, the dryer broke down in my house and instead of calling a repairman, uh, I fixed it myself and I posted all the progress on Twitter. Uh, I changed the lights on my house yesterday and uh, I, I'm going to post that and show people how to, you know, try and save money because I try and do all my repairs around the house myself. Um, I'd like people to learn about God through me. I would love someone to DM me and say, you know what, like after hearing you on the podcast, I took a look at the Bible and I took a look at the Jesus's life and I started learning about it. And that to me would be it would almost probably make me cry. <laughs> if you want to make Tommy boy cry, you DM me and say that, you know what? Jesus is, has come into my life and, and that's because of you. And maybe that's, that's how I want to close that question. I love that a lot. Yeah. Really, really cool. Then our end routine that I have, I think since the first podcast, actually, um, the, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Um, how will Bitcoin affect romantic relationships in the future? I thought that that question was interesting. <laughs> wow. Um, do you know what? Really? That is actually a good question. Uh, it's not one you would expect. So it really forces you to think on the fly. But um, I think it will affect, um, it will affect relationships, some in a positive way and some in a negative way, right? There's not going to be one box that you can put this question in. I think it's very important that if you are in a relationship that you should both have the same ideas uh, and be on the same page with Bitcoin. My wife, she understands Bitcoin, not maybe at the level I do, but she understands what it's trying to solve for, uh, you know, corruption, uh, inflation, uh, censorship, government overreach, like those things me and my wife are on the same page about. And, and that is just an, an umbrella over top of it is Bitcoin. So if you and your partner aren't on the same pages with Bitcoin, if one thinks it's a scam and the other thinks it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, it is going to cause some tension in the relationship. So I think you should both be on the same page. It, it will affect relationships. I think just like politics, right? Like you, you could have a Trump supporter and a Harris supporter and these people are fighting. I know people at work that, that lost um, spouses over the COVID vaccine. One, the husband didn't want to get it and the wife did. And, and it literally tore marriages apart. I'm like, it breaks my freaking heart. You know, and I know people that it did this to. And uh, I think Bitcoin is going to fall in the same class as that. Yeah, that, that that's true. It can really... Uh... Like if you're really a hardcore Bitcoiner and she really thinks it's a scam, then then I think it can really negatively impact that uh, as other big and huge topics. I'm very grateful that my girlfriend supports that. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Me too, Robin. And we she, don't know how grateful. Side, yeah. yeah, we don't know how blessed we are that our our partners uh, will listen to us because I know we just talk about Bitcoin nonstop. The poor things. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell your yeah, girlfriend absolutely. i'm sorry tell your girlfriend i'm sorry for me okay <laughs> poor thing <laughs> they're just like okay uh, yes really yes cool. bitcoin bitcoin i get it honey <laughs> really That's cool. awesome. perfect and uh, thank you so much for being on uh before i let you go where can people find you ask your questions and dm you uh when when they found uh the, the way to god that's it i love it robin uh i am at cooligan fields on twitter or you can search for Tommy Boy 21M. I do have the blue check mark, so make sure I have the check mark. There has been some scam accounts popping up lately. I guess people want to be me. Oh, 
uh, what is it? What do they say that um, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? So I'm flattered that people want to act like me, but just make sure you got the blue check mark. I will never DM you about financial advice. I will never ask you how the market is treating you. <laughs> but so I'm mostly <laughs> yeah. mainly on Twitter. If you want to find me, I'm on Twitter. And I put the real link to your real profile yes. on to Twitter uh, in the description so people can can easily find you there and just awesome. click on the link and then they are at your profile. Uh, really cool. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time, uh, Tommy. Uh, also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, to this for joining us today. Uh, I'll be back as always tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Nice.